Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Art and Science of Cultivating Living Soils webinar with Joe Tobias of Root Shoot Soils and myself, Javin Bernakovich, with Regenerative Living and All Points Design. What a lovely day to be talking to all of you about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is soil, which is taking and allowing us to understand that soil is alive underneath our feet. And that if we work with it instead of against it, we tend to have benefits far and wide, ranging from water holding capacity, fertility capacity, uh, total ability to grow and to produce fertility for the plants that are that wonderful byproduct, that bonus that we all love so much with great soil. I'm going to do a quick introduction to regenerative living uh, as, as well as myself and Joe, and then we'll get into Joe's presentation. So again, welcome. My name is Jan Bernakovich. This is Regenerative Living and the Art and Science of Cultivating Living Soils. For the last 15 years, I've worked with All Points Land Design, creating lives and landscapes that get better year after year, working on anything from balconies to 4,500 hectare farms in India. And I've also had the opportunity to work with a number of individuals on life design. So uh, we focus a lot on the land aspect, but the life aspect is just as important to make sure that we're working in and building ourselves in good ways and working with our decision-making capacity. Also had an opportunity to work with an incredible array of, of individuals over the years and has been a great joy of my life that I've been able to apply myself so practically for a decade and a half. Back in 2019, I reached out to Joe. Normally I talk about this story and Joe's not here because I've since worked with a lot of different instructors. I reached out to Joe and I said, Joe, what about what if we offered a, a course about living soils? Uh, would you be interested? And she was game to play. And so we offered our first course back in 2019 over 2020. Uh, had 30 students, sold out the course, and had just a great time with a group of gardeners, farmers, and wannabes uh, from all walks of life. And after that course, uh, which we called the Regenerative um agricultural workshops. Uh, I sat down as I do every year. I run a workshop on this, if anybody's interested, coming up for 2025. And I sat down and I envisioned what my next year would be like looking back on the previous year. And the previous year, one of the standout experiences was working with Joe and offering this course. So I thought, you know, this is great. We just offered a course specifically about an idea, a practicality, a technique, specifically cultivating living soils. What if I did that with other uh, folks that I work with that know. And thus the idea of regenerative living dot online was born a, a non ideological place where we can all start a skill or level up a skill to really take that practical skill to live on the planet as if we intend to stay. So while there's a lot of isms and ologies out there, um, regenerative living is really about the practical nature of those skills. And so over the last three years, we've had um, roughly 25 courses that have run, We've worked with rainwater harvesting with people like Gord Baird, who's an exceptional rainwater harvester, uh, harvester, or multifunctional hedgerows with Jude Hobbs, or this incredible family food security course to understand how much food your family eats and how to grow, harvest, trade, you name it, with uh, Kekasimu Squith, a Métis woman from Alberta. Uh, we've also had great courses about low-tech erosion control with Jeffrey Adams and Neil Bertrando, or how to grow pawpaws or biogas digesters. And we've had such a good time doing it that I've dedicated a portion of my time to do so. We've we've had a lot of great courses over the last couple of years. Coming up, we have, uh, of course, the Art and Science of Cultivating Living Soils with Joe Tobias, which starts November 6th. Centropic Farming just started. Uh, we've got a great course with Kelpie Wilson about practical biochar and a great course about practical key line design with Mark Krawcheck. And then next year, I'll be offering a regenerative business design course, helping people to start or level up their business within regenerative enterprises, as I've specialized in for the last 15 years, and then also uh, an, an advanced regenerative land design course. So we have all of these courses that are coming up, and it all starts with exceptional instructors and exceptional practitioners. And Joe is a near and dear friend. Um, I reached out years ago, we made a connection, and she became a mainstay, mainstay in my land design process. So working on large and small scale uh, landscapes, I always need to take metrics and understand where we're starting within the landscape. And so Joe's 
uh, advice and her microscopy testing and her overall assessment of the soil has been a necessity for any design I do in Western North America because she is so good at what she does. And while I know she's uh, upset that I'm going to panagerize and uh, flatter her like this, I, I say it with a great amount of love because it's no small thing to, to change direction, to go from, you know, uh, being in the tech world and then starting to really step into a love, a desire, a turning point, as so many of us have, to see the world better than we left it. I think all of us in this work do it because we love it, not because we're making com comparable salaries in the conventional world. We do it because this is the change we want to see in the world. And so with that, I've had an incredible experience with Joe. I've seen the landscapes I've worked on greatly benefit. I've also seen my education greatly benefit. While I had a fair amount of training in living soils, Joe's course back in 2019 was such a breath of fresh air because she brings a very unique perspective. While she studied with many individuals, including uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham, she's gone beyond a lot of those trainings to really encapsulate how do we make the best possible soils that we, we can with the materials we have. And so with that, Joe, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you so much for being willing to take the time out of your schedule to offer the art uh, and science of cultivating living soils. I'm really excited for the course and I'm really excited for everybody here. Just as a quick note before we start, the schedule of today is, I've done a little intro, Joe's gonna do a presentation. I'll then share uh, the upcoming course with everybody so folks can know what it's about. There's gonna be a limited time offer for everybody on the call today uh, until Sunday at midnight to get into the course at a very discounted price. Um, and then after that, we're gonna go into Q&A. So, if everybody takes a look at the bottom of their screen, there's that little question mark q and It's a great place to put your questions. Great questions uh, include understanding the topics that Joe are talking about. Four questions are, Joe, my land is in Canada. I want to make it better. How do I do so? Uh, on a webinar, we just don't have the time or the experience or the ability to ask you all the questions to create the context. Um, and those questions are best if... Um, if uh, you want to reach out to Joe directly and uh, connect with her as a consultant, or you want to jump into the course and understand that at a deeper level. So with that, Joe, thanks again for joining us. And I'm really excited to see the presentation today. Thanks, Javin. Those are some very generous words. No pressure though, right? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for having me here today. The art and science of cultivating living soils. I typically like to start with quotes when I'm doing presentations or uh, starting off my courses. So here's one I'd like to share with you all. A new ethic is required. A new attitude towards discharging our responsibility for caring for ourselves and for the earth. We must recognize the earth's limited capacity to provide for us. We must recognize its fragility. We must no longer allow it to be ravaged. This ethic must motivate a great movement, convincing reluctant leaders and reluctant governments and reluctant peoples themselves to effect the needed changes. So thank you for joining us here today. I just want to quickly introduce myself to everyone before we begin. My name is Joe Tobias. I am a regenerative soils and living compost specialist. I'm also the owner of a BDC-based company called Root Shoot Soils. I work primarily with land stewards, farmers, municipalities, uh, permaculturists, um, homesteaders, uh, community gardeners throughout uh, Canada. I studied under Dr. Elaine Ingham back in 2015. And from that journey, I found myself diving even deeper in soil ecology over the years. Before soil, my background was computing science. Um, I worked for various industries, building software applications, analyzing how people interact, um, understanding how data can be optimized and essentially working in an environment that asked, how can we do things better? And it wasn't until 2010 when I began transitioning, so roughly 14 years ago, when I began transitioning from computing science towards permaculture and then eventually soil ecology. And it was during that time when I visited my family in the Philippines that I saw firsthand the damaging practices of the Green Revolution still lingering in small farming communities. So um, if you're not aware of the Green Revolution, the intention behind that 
movement was to feed the world using technology, more hybridized crops, more chemicals. Farming rice is the livelihood of my family back home, and the Green Revolution prescribed the adoption of hybridized rice cultivars that require the intensive use of fertilizers and pesticides. So the journey that I'm on, the work that I do, is a uh, reverberation of witnessing the farmers in my homeland who were convinced that their traditional methods are inferior. So here I am, um, adapting in this new environment. And throughout this webinar, I also want to invite you to approach the subject of soil and composting with curiosity. And hopefully you take that same curiosity when you're out there tending to your garden or your farm. So today we're gonna to be covering soil and soil health, just a general definition, biological inoculants, so compost, compost extracts and teas, and a case study. So first, let's define soil. What is soil? So soil is an ecosystem. It is the outermost layer of the Earth's crust marked by living organisms. It is the site of intensive exchange of matter and energy among air, water, and rocks. The soil, as a part of the ecosystem, occupies the key position in the global cycles of substances, whether that's water or nutrients such as nitrogen, carbon, sulfur, phosphorus. So in other words, soil possesses properties of each of these zones. You have the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, and the biosphere. It's a multifunctional crossroad. So the pedosphere is basically that's the ground we're on right now. Right? It's where everything meets. So soil is complex, and I don't think we should shy away from that complexity. We deal with complexity on a daily basis. Our relationships with our loved ones are complex. The soil and your farm or your garden is another one of those complex relationships. And I think that it's good, it's, it's good for us to try to understand um, what that complexity or what that relationship is like. Here's another definition. So soil is one of the most diverse assemblages or diverse habitats on the earth and contains one of the most diverse assemblages of living organisms. So here you'll find bacteria, you'll find fungi, algae, roots, protozoas, different types of nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, beetles, ants, millipedes, all of these organisms participate in one way or another in the evolution and formation of soil, especially the organic fraction. There are dynamic relationships, diverse microhabitats, interconnectedness, so soil carries the stories of existence, the cycles of life and death. Um, so that's a general definition of soil. Let's talk about soil health. We hear a lot about improving soil health. How and, well, what is it and how? Soil health is the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And how can we achieve soil health? Well, by following these basic principles, keeping the soil covered as much as possible, so building up your soil's armor, minimizing soil disturbance, so you're keeping that stability, the aggregation in soil, maintaining that soil structure. You want to plant diversity to encourage soil biodiversity, keep living roots in the soil, integrating animals. If you're unable to, if you don't have the space for livestock or for, for, for birds on your farm or your garden or your little space, perhaps even um, dedicating a little bit for uh, pollinators in your area. And finally, achieving or, or knowing your context, how you implement each principle will depend on your context. But this, these principles, they don't seem complete to me, I feel like there's always something missing. We don't talk a lot about soil biology or the microbiome. I feel like this is a principle that we need to start to ad adopt as part of their as part of our practices. So restoring and maintaining a thriving community of soil organisms. I feel like this is one of the most neglected principles, again, that we need to, um, we need to incorporate into our management practices. Because you may have diverse plants above ground, but if you don't have soil organisms that can support those plants, they will be stressed. You may keep living roots in the soil and practice cover cropping, but again, if you don't have microorganisms to support your cover crops, 
your cover crops may not even germinate or they might they may be stressed. Most agricultural soils today are often bacterial dominated, lost their fungal biomass, fungivorous arthropods, so these are organisms that feed on fungi, and macrofauna populations. So those are your earthworms, your beetles, your millipedes, your centipedes. The challenges involved in restoring a more balanced and fully functional biological community to agricultural soils should not be underestimated, as most soils used for agriculture have been under intensive management for at least 50 years. That is a very, very brief blip in the Earth's lifetime, yet somehow we managed to destroy life in the soil within that very short time frame. But why do we want to restore the soil microbiome? Why should we care? Because the living community supports the existence of all hyertrophic life forms by providing these ecosystem services. Nutrients can be recycled. They can be retained in the soil, thereby supporting plant growth. Water can be infil infiltrated, uh, storage or stored. Disease and pest suppression, detoxification of harmful chemicals, healthy soils, uh, supports the production of food, feed, fiber, and fuel. And finally, provision of health. Uh, soils that have diverse microorganisms, they are a massive medicine cabinet. A lot of our medicine comes from microorganisms that produce them in soil. The health of soil, plant, animal, and human is one indivisible whole. Lee, Lady Eve Balfour, one of the pioneers of organic food and farming, once said. So science around the microbiome has revealed that we have never been individuals. Each and every single one of us, whether you're a plant, an animal, a mycorrhizal fungi, your dog, a fish, we all have a microbiome. We are shaped and influenced by the microorganisms on and in our bodies. And there's a ter term for this. It's called a hollow biont. A hollow biont is defined as an assemblage of host and the many other species living in or around it, which together form a discrete ecological unit. So you're an ecology, I'm an ecology, your cat, your dogs, your chickens, they're all discrete ecological units. So now you probably already know that it's critical for us to consider the microbiome that covers the entire plant body. So it's not about, really, it's, it is about soil, but it's about the entire organism that lives in that, in that ecosystem. Whatever you're growing from root to shoot is covered in microorganisms. So we have the rhizosphere the region of soil that is directly influenced by plant roots, where dynamic interactions are taking place between the microbes and the plants and the predators that want to eat those microbes. And then we have the phylosphere, the total above ground surfaces of the plant. And since the 1950s, there has been a growing interest in understanding the complex microbial habitats and interactions found on all parts of the plant. Every part of that plant, like us, harbors a diverse array of microorganisms, and those organisms interact with the plant, affecting its health and functions. So here's a great example. Um, I love talking about this study because it really captures people's attention. <clears throat> they did a study in Austria on a specific variety of apple. I can't remember what, what it is. Um, apples are one of the most consumed fruits worldwide. And a study was done to identify the microbial community in apples grown industrially versus organically. So the names here on the right, these are all bacteria genera. So if we were to take the fruit pulp, the seeds or the peel of an apple, and compare organically grown versus conventionally grown apples, one of the first things you'll notice is the diversity in color, especially the fruit pulp. You can see the variation or the different types of colors here, which relates to the bacteria genera, versus on the conventional side, we see this color that tends to dominate the pulp or the, and the seeds and the peel. Now, this color relates to a bacteria group called Ralstonia. And this group of bacteria, there are species in the group that are devastating 
plant pathogens. They are opportunistic human pathogens, but they are also important degraders of synthetic chemicals or chemicals that are foreign to the body or the natural system. So you can kind of guess what those chemicals are, right? Conventional systems, they tend to use uh, fertilizers. They tend to use different types of pesticides. So this group of bacteria, they thrive in these systems, in the conventional systems, because they use those chemicals as food. They, are, they can degrade those synthetic chemicals. Um, since they are significantly present in those systems, it's quite concerning because we are unintentionally selecting for that group of bacteria that may cause or that are devastating human pathogens. They also cause bacterial wilt on plants. So they cause diseases on plants. So what conventionally, what conventional growers are doing is they're inadvertently selecting for a group of bacteria that can cause disease. It's not, it's not the bacteria's fault, right? We are inadvertently selecting for them because of the type of inputs that we are using. So it kind of makes you wonder, um, what am I putting in my body? Right? The food that we think is healthy for us has now become poison. So it's just something to keep in mind. So how do you restore microbial life in the soil if the soil looks like this to begin with? Do you start with cover crop seeds and hope they germinate? How do you get organisms into the soil? So one of the best tools that I use is high quality biodiverse compost. Now the key word here is a, it's a tool. It's not the end all be all. Ideally you use this tool and combine it with the other soil health principles as I mentioned that I mentioned earlier, uh, keeping living roots in the soil, integrating livestock, planting diversity. So really getting a, a good idea of, of your landscape and combining all the different tools so that you know, the more integrated the approach is, the more successful you will be in growing healthier plants. So now let's get into compost and the power of compost. What is compost? Compost is a result of an aerobic decomposition process, meaning it needs air, exhibiting a mending, fertilizing character, and contains diverse soil organisms. So with composting, what we're doing is we're facilitating a decomposition process. So we're providing a habitat to ensure that the biology growing and thriving in our compost are given sufficient amount of oxygen and moisture so that they can effectively decompose the materials or the ingredients that you're using. So let's break down this uh, definition a little bit more. What do I mean by exhibiting amending? So compost, when you're putting it out into the soil, it should contain compounds. It should contain uh, chemicals is, that are produced by microorganisms that when you put it out into the soil, those compounds will be stored and it will eventually be absorbed by the plant or microorganism. So the nutrients are retained in the soil. Compost should have fertilizing character, meaning that it contains bioavailable nutrients so that when you put it out into your soil, those nutrients will be readily available for the plants that are in the system or another soil or another soil organism. And finally, it should contain diverse soil organisms. So compost is not only about returning organic matter into the soil, but it's also bringing back the organisms to replenish the life system of the land. So if you think about, say, a garden or a field where you've just harvested all the fruits, you've harvested the leaves, that's a lot of nutrients and energy that the plant had basically pulled up from the soil and now it's being taken away. So composting is a way of cycling back those nutrients and allowing that system to recover from that event. So you're essentially replenishing the microbiome of your land when you're using high quality biodiverse compost. The process of composting is an aerobic decomposition. So again, it needs oxygen, it needs air, and it's aided by the activity of a complex food web. So as a composter, my job is to make sure that the biology I'm growing or farming in my compost have adequate water and oxygen. So where do the organisms come from in my compost pile? They come from the organic material that I collect to make my compost, as well as the environment 
where I am making my compost. Somehow little critters, a lot of different types of arthropods find their way into my compost pile after I turn it the third time. And so they then uh, have the role to decompose the material even further. So I see a lot of mites. I see a lot of springtails. Those organisms feed on fungi. And it's good to see those organisms because they're they're now in charge of the pile. It's, it's good to see the the web that forms in a compost pile. So many folks refer to composting as waste reduction. I don't particularly like to use that term because I don't see the materials as waste. I see the materials as resources. If the perspective is waste, you're just going to get garbage in, garbage out. That's not what composting is. If the perspective is raw resources, you may treat the materials with greater respect. We can produce something more valuable out of the materials than the raw individual raw materials themselves. So again, when we compost, we are playing a part in cycling nutrients back to the soil. Successful composting systems depend on creating conditions that are favorable to the growth and activity of diverse microbial communities. I feel like a broken record. It's really, again, it's our job is to grow the biology, grow your workforce. That's essentially what it is. These organisms, they have the ability to work with plants and plants have the ability to work with them. They are much better at farming or gardening or growing plants than we are. These are your partners. Get the microbes out there. There are trillions of them. We can provide the right habitat and food for them in a compost pile and get your workforce out into the field because they're the ones that that's going to do the work for you. These tiny little creatures, they're much better at growing than we are. So here's a sample compost recipe. This is a typical recipe that I use um, in late fall or really early spring for my thermophilic compost piles when there's not enough green material available. So my recipe changes depending on the season. Um, and thermophilic compost piles are categorized um, in three ways. So you have the high nitrogen material, you have the green materials, and then you have the woody materials. High nitrogen, these are the protein source for microbes. So these are labile organic matter. They're easily digested by bacteria. And then you have the green component. This component helps maintain the thermophilic process. So it maintains the heat um, that is necessary to uh, to get rid of pathogens or disease-causing organisms and weed seeds especially. And it's an intermediate organic matter food, meaning that both fungi and bacteria can feed on this component. And then we have the woody or brown component. This is mo more of a fungal food source. It's recalcitrant, so it's harder to decompose. So it's essential for us to have, again, different types of ingredients to use in a compost pile. The more diversity you have in a compost pile, the more different types of organic or organisms you will, you will, uh, you'll grow. So using high quality compost is a means to effectively replenish the soil microbiome. High quality compost heals soils that lack a thriving microbiota that support plant growth. Which then takes us to compost extracts and tea. So I hope you have a pretty good understanding of what compost or composting is all about. Again, one thing I want everyone to remember is this, the quality of your compost extract and compost tea is determined by the quality of your base ingredient, which is your compost. If you don't have the biological diversity in your compost, you can't expect your extracts and teas to have biodiversity. You can't grow what doesn't exist. So how can we maximize our high quality compost piles? I, we don't just spread them onto the soil. And I apologize uh, beforehand for the lagginess here. Um, I have a video on the slide, but I think you get the gist. I'm just basically, I have my compost extract and compost D and I'm testing out my sprayer, making sure that I'm uh, staying on to, everything is working essentially, my equipment. So in a lot of ways, applying biology and plant available nutrients in a liquid form is more feasible. Let water be the carrier. The mobile microscopic organisms in your compost, like your protozoas and nematodes, require water to move around. So again, let water be the carrier. 
and get them into the pore spaces of the soil as best as you can. Okay, so making extracts and teas, combining them with the other five soil health principles, um, they all support one another. If you don't have enough compost for your farm or garden, um, use water as your carrier to get your microbes out into the soil. So let's get into a couple of definitions. What is the difference between a compost extract and a compost tea? A compost extract is the process of extracting organisms and soluble nutrients in water from compost versus a compost tea. It's the process of brewing an extract. So you do that first step, you make an extract, but then you add what I call microbial supplements to encourage the growth of beneficial organisms. So here's a better side-by-side -side comparison. With a compost tea, it's a foliar application versus a compost extract is a soil application. Really what you're trying to use the compost tea for is you wanna get the above ground surfaces of the plant to be covered in microorganisms. Versus a compost extract, you want to inoculate the rhizosphere, the region of soil surrounding plant roots. With a compost tea, you add foods at the start of the brew to grow those organisms. Whereas with a compost extract, you're not adding uh, any foods at the start of the brew. You can add them at the end before you spray, if you like, but you're also not brewing for an extended period of time. So with teas, you brew for 24 hours. You're allowing those organisms to grow. They are going to start producing glues in that liquid, which helps them stick to the above ground surfaces of the plant. And that action protects, helps protect the plant. Um, it helps inhibit potential disease-causing organisms to take over the leaves or the stems or whatever else on that plant. Uh, and with an extract, mo microbes do not grow in the brewer. Compost teas and extracts, they are both generally used for, for managing disease, but with teas, it's managing disease on the, on the phylosphere, so the above ground surface. Um, there are exceptions, though. With compost teas, you can use it in soil. Um, you can use, can use it in soils with organic matter levels that are below 3%. Versus an extract, you have to have enough organic matter in the soil to support your microbes. So it has to be uh, more than 5%. All right, so I'm going to do a little uh, case study here with a uh, little dog farm out in Creston, uh, British Columbia. So these are my farmer collaborators, Kathy and Ian Finley. They are the owners of Little Dog Farm. They are regenerative farmers. Um, they have been farming since 2013. They started with a five acre lot in uh, a place called Langley here in BC. And then they moved to Creston back in 2019 or 2020 and, and moved their business to a 60 acre parcel of land. So a quick summary of my first conversation with Kathy and Ian. They want to uh, basically have a mixed species orchard for cider production. So soil health is an issue. There's virtually no life in the soil, uh, poor organic matter levels. So Ian did get his soil tested um, for organic matter. He wants to also produce compost, extracts, and teas on site to support his trees. And he wants to do soil testing for the initial five years until the orchards are established and flourishing. So in April 2021, they invited me to their farm to do the initial site visit. These were the photos I took during that time. Um, unfortunately, soil management historical data does not exist. So the former owner of the farm uh, said he didn't spray. Um, he primarily grew hay and tilled heavily for a significant number of years. So excessive tilling can actually cause this type of destruction in the soil. You don't have to put chemicals in the soil to produce something like this. You just have to till a lot multiple times during the season to get results like this. So the land was left bare when Kathy and Ian took ownership of the property. Um, you can see just by these photos that a lot of work needed to get it needed. We, we needed to do a lot of work to get it to a living state. So here's a different section of their farm, which is, uh, this is the South Orchard. This is front part of their field. Um, you can see how very little structure there is in the soil. This is an area where they planted vegetables. They put vegetables or carrots in the year before. 
Um, and then a few months later, you could tell that there's no biology because the carrots didn't even decompose. It was just mushy vegetables. So there's definitely absence of biological activity. Um, these photos were taken a month after my, my visit. This is what it looked like after ripping and disking one of the fields for two days solid. So one of the decisions we had to make was there's so much compaction in the soil. Um, how are we going to deal with compaction? Because we don't think plant roots are not going to be able to penetrate through the soil profile if we don't do anything beforehand. So we thought, hey, you know, we'll call it restorative disturbance, right? So do a couple more passes of tillage to break up the compaction. So the soil is already pretty horrible. It's not going to hurt it uh, doing a couple more. But in this case, we did do the spray or the disking and the ripping, but we also incorporated biological applications on top of that, as well as uh, seeding cover crops. But seeding cover crops was the germination was sparse. There was no biology to wake up the seeds, nor was there any to support them. So the cover crops themselves had a difficult time thriving in these conditions. So one of the first things that Ian did was he set out to build compost. This was his initial setup. We started with roughly four cubic yards for 25 acres, which is not a lot of compost. So this was a spring and fall treatment. The reason also for choosing a small volume to begin with is so that Ian can get a sense of how to properly manage his compost piles and have a good understanding of the resources available to him locally. You know, connect with other uh, folks in his community where he can get those resources to make his piles with. So throughout the month of May, he recorded the temperature from each of his compost piles, took photos of the logs, which I got him to do, sent them to me, and I supported him remotely in managing and monitoring his piles. So this data allowed us to identify when is it a good time to turn the piles or why pile one or pile two is behaving differently than pile three and pile four. So out of the four piles, we were only able to use two piles for the treatments. So our success rate initially was 50% as far as thermophilic composting goes. This is, again, Ian's first time, and we're just trying to understand the process here. So we're bound to run into mistakes and some life lessons. So we essentially ended up with less than two cubic yards for 25 acres. So here's the raw data. When I analyze the compost, the fungal to bacterial ratio is below the minimum desired for deciduous trees. So he wanted to plant apples and all these different types of trees to build his orchard and make cider. So this is a highly bacterial dominated compost, but on purpose. So the question is, can we use the compost piles for extracts and teas, even though the fungal to bacterial ratio is outside or it's, much, it's not what we're looking for for trees? And the answer is yes, absolutely. This is what they had to fix on the left. The compost piles had a very good population of protozoas and nematodes. These are organisms that feed on bacteria. Having predators, or at least these are there are species of uh, nematodes and protozoas that feed on bacteria and having bacterial feeders in place keep the bacterial communities active. They are forced to reproduce, they're forced to multiply and build habitats to protect themselves. And that process helps rebuild the soil structure. And it's also, again, critical to combine organic matter building practices, such as cover cropping with your inoculants, with your extracts and teas. It's really pointless to spray teas and extract when the soil looks like this and you don't have any plants in place. So just gotta make sure that you're combining different principles here. And it was also in 2021, when we had the heat wave here in BC, we weren't able to treat the fields until October of that year. So I revisited the farm and trained Ian on how to make his own extracts and teas using the compost piles that he assembled uh, four to five months before. So using microscopy, I supported him in quality assurance. For volume, he was only spraying less than 100 liters per acre, so roughly 25 gallons per acre. And you can see how dark that liquid is. We didn't add molasses. We don't typically add molasses as part of the brew. Um, 
we don't do it until after. So that's another thing that I can talk more about as part of the course, why we don't put it um, as part of the compost D process. But in this case, the this color comes from the decomposition of the microbes. So this is the North Orchard section of the farm. On the left is what the field looked like in May 2021. So around the time that I did my initial site visit. And a year later, after only three treatments, the cover crops that didn't germinate, they woke up. And this is what it looked like. This is the same field later in the year. You can see how much biomass has been created. So again, the cover crop seeds didn't wake up until we started spraying those teas and extracts. This was our first step in rejuvenating the soil. At this point, it was just allowing the plants to do their thing, allowing them to set seed and reseed for the next season before preparing the field for tree planting. So really encouraging above ground growth that will eventually get incorporated into the soil to nurture below ground growth. Here's a different section of the farm. So this one is called the South Orchard. On the left hand side is what it looked like during my visit. And then a year and a half later, we are starting to see uh, huge changes. And one thing I also want to mention, um, because the majority of the cover crops didn't germinate initially before the treatments, we discussed the role of weeds. Weeds essentially became the covers that we needed to rebuild soil life. So whoever wanted to be there, we let them be there. Um, they had a seed bank already in place, their cover crop seeds were there. So was it necessary to buy more seeds, take that financial risk? If we know there's no biology to support them, uh, the answer was no. They Again, it was just allowing those plants to wake up and we were confident that the microbes will wake them up. And then last year, this is what they sent me. So visible fungal growth above ground in the South Orchard, these are puff balls. Big round of applause to both Kathy and Ian. Uh, but the work doesn't stop here with soil remediation. We'll con continue monitoring the soil and the trees, making sure that we're moving in the right direction. Um, so yeah, it's really great to see how much change we can, uh, how much impact we have in a short period of time when we partner with microbes, right? Again, they have the means to they do what they do best. And I think that it's it's important for us to pay attention to them and what they're capable of. And with that, um, thank you, Javin. I'm gonna pass it back to you. Thanks, Joe. That was uh, incredible. I think there's always gonna be a time in my life as um, a land steward, as both a homesteader, farmer, regenerative land designer, there's always gonna be this this divide between when I understood that there was living soil microorganisms and by working with them, everything became better and then doing the work as well. There's kind of like two gates. It's like you understand it and then you actually apply it. So if folks out there are working with landscapes, if you're looking to work with landscapes, if you have your own plot of land, farm, house, front yard, backyard, growing plants in any way, shape or form, understanding this is a fundamental piece to growing well. And Joe's work is exemplary of that, about how you start with something as degraded, overtilled, probably with hard pan, has lost soil structure, has lost color, has lost water holding capacity, has lost cation exchange capacity, which is one of the metrics we use to understand how much fertility potential a soil has and can move it you know, the, the needle gets moved so quickly in just a year of application. It's it's really quite remarkable. The other thing, which I think is a, uh, something to point out to everybody is um, Joe, Joe took my advice of a 45 minute presentation to heart and the amount of information she is able to convey in a short amount of time is exquisite. It's just exceptional. It's hard to find practitioners, hard to find instructors that both go to together and Joe is both. So as people are starting to say, thanks for the presentations, very inspiring, great presentation. And uh, yeah, hats off to you, Joe, as always. So for everybody who's been watching and been wa seeing and looking and understanding what this is and is interested 
in learning about this, I'm going to quickly do a review of the course of what's coming up. Um, and then we'll have a chance to go to Q&A. So if you have any questions that have come up, please put it into the Q&A section, not the chat. The chat is not being monitored for questions. Please put it into the Q&A. Um, and we'll get an opportunity to answer those questions. And then everybody who's interested will have an opportunity to register in the course uh, for a very time li limited um, discount until Sunday. And then we have three draws for spots in the course. So everybody who stays uh, until the end of the Q&A will have a chance for that. So again, huge thanks to Joe for taking the time to not only present, but also the decade of experience of learning, distilling, putting everything together. This is the thing about educators is that you have somebody who has spent a decade of time, hundreds of thousands of dollars in missed opportunity cost, active costs, active learning costs, and they've learned what they've learned to become the practitioner they are. And now they're willing and able to take the time to distill that into a course for all of us. So the question then becomes, do you want to learn how to create and apply exceptional compost? Is that something that's important to you? Is it important to learn this approach to improve your soil? But you could learn that yourself. You could go through the 10 years of education and mistakes. As Joe so expertly showed, not everything goes perfect all the time. So a lot of what Joe does, not only with her consultants like me, but also with her farmers, is she helps them to understand what the mistakes were and how to improve upon those mistakes. This is an Olympic event. You don't get it right every single time on the first time. This is a practice, a process that we develop. This is very much process-based agriculture. It's not an input-based agriculture. We're working with the, the natural, the native processes and improving upon them so that way we have the results we're looking for. And being guided by somebody who's made those mistakes. Like we all have to learn from somebody's mistakes. They just don't have to be our own. They can be somebody who's dedicated their time, their energy, their life force to this. And that's why individuals like Joe and the rest of the instructors with uh, regenerative living are so exceptional because they are practitioners and educators combined. And as everybody knows, YouTube is a wonderful place to be. There's lots of books. But being guided step by step by step through something, there's nothing else that compares to it because you have the ability to ask a question, to try something yourself, to come back to a conversation and actually be guided in a way that normally you'd be paying an hourly consultation fee, which you know over time adds up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there's a great opportunity here as well. So everybody can trial and error. And I did that for the first five years of my education and my application as a regenerative land designer, a farmer, and an urban homesteader. I made a lot of errors, I tried a bunch, and I lost a lot of time, money, and sleep. Or every once in a while, you get to a place of just saying, okay, I want a simple strategic system that can help me out. And so back when I started my microgreens business in Victoria, Canada, I reached out to Chris Thoreau of the Food Peddlers, and I said, Chris, I want to know how to do this. What's the price? He quoted as a price that we thought was outlandish, and we said, fine, we just want to get there quickly. And that's one of the great things about taking education, especially in-person education, even if it's online, is you have that ability to have the simple system that somebody else has already worked out, apply it fully in your own uh, area ability, and then come back to it and refine when issues come up. So this class is 10 sessions. We have 20 hours of class presentation and class time. It'll be five hours of Q&A, and there's 22 curated resources, including a couple of exercises that people are going to go through to really understand soil and disease and how to apply some of this regenerative soil approach to those types of issues. But instead of me just telling you, why don't I show you exactly what this all looks like? So here's the landing page for the art and science of living soils. And here you're going to get a sense of why you might want to join. You want to see soil as an ecosystem. You want to make better compost. You want to reduce effects of disease, explore the soil food web, hear case studies, gain practical next steps. And as many people have said, when it comes to Joe's course, they would also like to do it without breaking the bank. There are some other courses out there about uh, living soil, which are quite expensive. And it's a hard first step to get into. The other thing is that we've got 10 live sessions, you get all of the recordings, you get a year access to all the material, you can really build these practical skills. But more importantly, anybody who came to on this call today 
is a nerd or a geek when it comes to ecological living, to regenerative living. And you get to be around a group of other nerds and geeks as you dive into this information. Nothing like like-minded community. So the course is a good fit for agricultural professionals, gardeners, homesteaders, permaculture designers, environmentalists, educators, and students, or policymakers and planners. What would our world look like if all parks departments in all cities understood this at a fundamental level. It means we would reduce our inputs, we would reduce the amount of die-off, which would reduce the amount of replacement. This as a skill is essential. We are going to see any sort of uh, infinite future with humans on the planet. Some people aren't going to like this course. Some people who are thinking, well, it's all about inputs and it's all about agriculture solutions without uh, environmental considerations. Those who are saying, well, it's just the way it is, and they're coming to battle. Those are just looking for basic garden tips. This isn't about basic gardening. This is about how do we understand the soil at a fundamental level, make good compost, create excellent compost extracts and teas, and apply it well to the landscape. So here we've got 10 sessions. We're doing intro to soil as an ecosystem, ecological process in soil, part one, decomposition, organic matter, ecological processes in, in soil, part two, nutrient cycling and soil structure. We're gonna get into the rhizosphere and the soil food web in two modules, really getting into the different microorganisms, what we need, why we need them and how to produce them. We're gonna get into the philosphere, the endosphere and the human health. So how does this apply to us as people? How can we increase our health? We're gonna get into the art and science of living compost, which again, I wasn't a bad compost maker, uh, I'm sure. And I know Joe was like, you know, you're doing a few things you could improve upon. And after our first course, I was so pleased to have refined my process and to develop it well. We're also gonna be talking about restoring landscapes with compost extracts and teas. So how to use that compost, make those teas and extracts and apply it well, showing and going into further depth like the case study of Little Dog Farm. Guide to soil health, so minimizing losses from disease-causing organisms. It's not just about biology, it's about understanding biology is important. And also as an ecosystem of next step. So this will be Zoom uh, presentations, two hours, an hour of presentation, 20 minute group discussion. So you'll get into small groups, connect with your, your local classmates, and then 30 minutes of Q&A to ask any question under the sun. We're gonna start November 6th, gonna go until mid-December, gonna take a three week break so everyone can enjoy the turnover of the year and then come back in January to finish strong. Calls will start at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time and then uh, off of that. And the regular price for this course is usually 400. Currently right now it's at 299. That's gonna end in October, 20, uh, October uh, 23rd. So one thing I wanna talk about here, which I think is pretty important is that there's an ability with anybody to see a course and say, okay, well that, that looks okay, but you know, what do other folks have to say about this course? And from our previous students uh, and previous clients, folks really like working with Joe. After more than 50 years of gardening, this was the course to take. Joe makes the science of soil easy to understand and immediately applicable. Her enthusiasm, knowledge, and willingness to share all aspects of soil science are well worth it. She's got the dirt on dirt. 50 years of gardening, finally figured it out. Made the course very engaging. We analyzed soil samples and built thermophilic compost. This is one of her in-person courses. Joe helped to open my eyes to the world of soil microorganisms and their linkages to plant health. To taking Joe's course, I knew I wanted to work with Joe and change my growing practices. Over the last two years, amazing progress has been made to transform the soil. Um, I grow and improve the cut flowers I'm able to supply to my customers. Vase life, stem strength, and overall floral quality improved significantly, which has been noted by my customers. This was a, a client of Joe's who was growing cut flowers, and the final product that she sells improved dramatically. So just think of this from a perspective of, what if your produce lasted longer than the competitors? What if your produce was more flavorful? What if your produce was more nutritious? These are all the solutions that can, pardon me, these are all the results from the solutions of working with living soil. From Rachel, I'm on grateful for her opportunity to learn from Joe. She offered what I think was the most imperative and effective practices I could have ever learned to implement at my land management at Paradise Fields. Shifting my understanding of soil from a chemical lens to a biological lens has made all the difference in how I approach earthwork. Thanks, Joe. Well-versed, clear explanations and a fountain of knowledge, Joe broke down the science info into concepts that were easy to comprehend. This is the big piece. We, we all remember horror stories from thinking back to science in high school and university, but having somebody who can break it down is essential. 
including personal experiences that could be drawn upon for teaching. It's been one of the most fulfilling courses I've taken and it left me wanting to pursue more knowledge on the topic of soil restorations. Joe has a wealth of knowledge and after each soil test, we discuss the numbers, good and bad in the soil food web, what are the next steps or organic inputs, cover crops to, to change the numbers in our favor, more beneficial organisms. We're well on our way to having a sustainable farming practice. So some of you who might be farmers or gardeners, you want to work with Joe, but you want some background knowledge first before you hire her as a consultant. This is a great way to do so. You're starting a farm, thinking about farming or wanting to scale up or you're enterprising ways that harmonize with nature and most importantly, make great soil, then you have to take this course. I enjoyed the whole course, the formal learning, the case studies and the examples taken from your own situations. I really like that we could ask questions and you both would share your thoughts and experiences. I've developed a great approach to managing, uh, to building and managing soil. And finally, I know now, like all the way, how to make amazing compost. Thank you so much. I love learning from you both. That's the big piece. You know, you can, you can play a lot with it. You can work a lot with it. But eventually, what happens is you have to actually have the right knowledge to do so. So at the end of the course, you'll feel comfortable and uh, with understanding the how and why and when of living soils and making incredible compost and extracts and teas. Joel will walk you step by step through the process to assess and create these living soils and compost. You'll feel clear, confident, and ready to start or progress your projects. So this course, which is normally $399, is $299 now until October 23rd. But if you want to take us up on our offer, come Sunday night at midnight, the offer of getting $50 off the course, getting it for the lowest possible price of $249 in. So if you're interested, this is a great time to take advantage of this course. Okay, with that, Joe, uh, I'm gonna jump on back and I'm gonna start asking you some questions from the list and we'll see how many we can get through in the next 30 minutes. Okay, so the bacteria like to have air, the fungi need to be kept underground so they so that, so they only, so they need only the air that would be available underground. And we need both to have healthy soil. Are we not moving beyond an acidic bacteria rich soil to more climate ecology fungal rich soil? Or is there a balance of both types that Eric are working toward? Hmm. I don't know if I completely understand that question, but Joe, what do you think about that? Um, I, I guess, yeah, I'm just trying to make sense of the question myself. Uh, uh, Whoever wrote this question, can you, I, I guess, maybe elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by, are we not moving beyond an acidic bacterial rich soil to a more climax ecology fungal rich soil? Or is there a balance of both types? Um, yeah, I don't know what the question is asking. Um, what, about, what are your thoughts, Javid? I don't know. Um, the bacteria like to have air, the fungal need to be kept underground. So they need only the air that would be available underground. So soil is terrestrial. It, it has interstitial airspace between different soil peds. A soil ped is the name we use for a grouping of soil. It's like a soil molecule. So yes, indeed, fungi uh, do, do need to have air as, as almost all microorganisms do. All um, oxygen loving microorganisms aerobes versus anaerobes, which are non-oxygen uh, loving. We need both to have healthy and we need both to have healthy soils. Yeah. So I think what Joe is showing is that within the soil food web, you need all of those organisms. And this was originally shown through uh, Elaine Ingham's uh, piv um, seminal study where she was growing a wheat seedling. And in each one of these little terrariums, she had one element of the soil food web, and then she added different elements together to showcase that you really needed them all to have a very healthy plant. So yes, you do need them both. Are we not moving beyond an, an acidic bacteria rich soil to more climax ecology fungal rich soil? I think that's what she's trying, what, what she showed is that that fungal bacterial ratio of what the farmer wanted to do, which is move towards a perennial culture, moving towards orchard, was really moving towards a fungally rich culture. And that's why even though those, those compost piles of the four, there was only two, uh, of those two, the bacteria fungal ratio wasn't as high as they wanted. It was still valuable to apply to the point of the photos, it actually still growed. But as you take a look at succession from disturbance on one side and climate ecology on the other side, fungal to bacterial ratios um, favor bacteria on disturbance and then favor dramatically fungal towards succession in like 10,000, 20,000 to one. 
Um, or is there a balance of both types? It really depends on what you're trying to grow because within that successional range, I think you have to be conscientious about what you're trying to grow. That's how I read the question, Joe. I'm, I, I wonder if that helps a bit more to add what you're we're curious about. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I agree with everything you said. Sorry, I'm also trying to answer people's questions while you're chatting. Oh, no worries. No worries. Let's just focus on the, the Q&A. That's all right. Um, Andra. Do we get a link to the course later? Yes, everybody is going to get a link to the course probably tomorrow or um, to the course. Yeah, it's actually in, in the chat. Sorry, I read that as a, a link to the webinar. Does the course have a section on how to use the microscope to analyze soil? No, it's not going to be a course specifically about microscopy. We are looking at potentially offering that in the years to come. This would be one of those foundational courses that people would take. And then uh, as we gauge interest, as we do with all the courses with regenerative living, see if there's enough people who actually want to do this um, themselves. Answer live. Question, what am I missing? Great question. No idea. <laughs> uh, Karen, regarding cover crops, assuming that they are not tilled in, how do I process the above ground growth on the crops? Good question. Um, Karen, what do you mean by process the above ground growth? Is it, uh, do you mean after the above ground growth, you know, when you get that massive biomass above ground, how do you deal with it after? Um, yeah, Karen, if you're still here with us, feel free to put, um, just a follow-up into the chat. I'll quickly, uh, keep my eye on it and then we'll come yeah. back. Yeah. Sorry. Maybe I'll add, I think, okay. So Karen, um, one thing that Ian did do, uh, he, so he didn't till it in. We didn't want to till in the cover crop, all that biomass. So what he did was he, um, he chopped it down. He does have a mower. He also incorporated livestock into his system recently um, to help mow down the cover crops. Um, so instead of tilling it in, because we are trying to build structure, tilling will uh, destroy the structure that the microbes and that, you know, the structure that, that we've been trying to, to recuperate essentially. Um, so the thing that he did do is he, he, uh, you can either crimp it if you have a crimper or you can you can mow it. So that is what he did. He ran over his cover crops and then he chopped them up. So as a, a supplementary here from Karen, what example, for example, do I hoe it at a few inches high, chop it and compost? Yeah, absolutely. You can do that. Yeah, you can hoe it. Uh, you could chop it depending on the scale that you're working with as well. If you can do it manually or, you know, if you need machinery, chopping it is best. Crimping it is also good. Um, and the thing that we also incorporated as part of, as part of the practice is instead of just uh, chopping down the cover crop, um, he also sprayed it. So he mowed it. He sprayed it with it more inoculants to increase the deco to. Uh, promote decomposition of the cover crop. Um, and then I can't remember what else he did. But yeah, I'm pretty sure he just mowed it down. Yeah, and this is a great example of, of how we're trying to increase the amount of organic matter into our soils so that way the soils are then self-supporting. So either mm -hmm. cut, uh, chop and drop, cutting, reincorporation. Again, I think what Joe pointed out so well is that when you are establishing a soil food web within the soil, every time you till it, you disturb that soil food web. There's a plume of nutrition that comes out of it, which is why uh, tilling is so popular, but you set back the entire ecology. So starting out at the beginning for some tilling and then working forward um, and, and doing as little disturbance as possible, especially in perennial systems is very useful. Stuart, as an apartment dweller, I'm interested in Bokashi and worm bin systems. Any advice or recommendations for how to get the best microbe you can out of such systems? I would say use as many diverse ingredients as you can. You can also harvest some. Uh, if you're just starting up with uh, your worm bin system, perhaps harvesting some soil from a, a nearby forest or a healthy ecosystem somewhere and inoculate that worm bin with the microbes from that healthy ecosystem. And so that'll kickstart the, the biology in your worm bin system or your bokashi. I think bokashi comes, comes with... Uh, uh, an inoculant already. So yeah, you can definitely do that or, or a healthy compost as well. Awesome. 
Thanks, Joe. From Deborah, thank you for making the world a better place, Joe. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. From Anonymous, wonderful presentation, Joe. Can you elaborate on some failures you've had with the biological process approach you have? Yeah, I would say I wouldn't really call them failures. I would just call them challenges. Uh, the, the biggest challenge really is uh, the weather is a huge challenge in this approach because we really have to work with, um, we can't work in the summer when spraying biology um, because you don't really want to subject your biology under UV stresses. So you want to make sure, and also moisture or lack of moisture. So timing your applications, it's a huge challenge for a lot of farmers. Uh, we want to work with rain. We want to work with snow. We want to work with the season, much like you do with your, with your seeds, when to plant your seeds, right? But at a large scale, I think the biggest challenge is um, getting your biology out there at a time that works for them. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, from Susanna. Hi, Joe. This is a powerful, uh, this is so powerful and inspiring. I've been vermicomposting for the past four years and it was great seeing the compost gang in your slides. Do you know why, do you know any example of integrating vermicompost and compost teas? Absolutely. I, uh, you could vermicompost and compost teas. So first it's, it's really easy to uh, screw up a compost tea if you don't have the proper aeration. So you got to get that part right. But one thing that I am also getting some producers to use, if they do have vermicompost and they want to use compost tea, you can extract some of that vermicompost and add it into your compost tea at the end of the brewing cycle. So meaning that you brew your compost tea, you grow your microorganisms, and then you take some of that vermicompost and extract all the different hormones and all the different compounds that the worm casts contain, and you put that in your tea, and then that's the stuff that you spray out into your field. Awesome. And I think there's also Brian Vogg down in the States who does a lot of connection with um, vermicomposting and compost teas that you could take a look at there, uh, Susanna. Mm -hmm. Sandy, hi. When fields are taken over by noxious weeds, what's the first step? Oh, a lot of times people like to till. <laughs> depends on the nauseous weed, really. It depends on what you're trying to grow in that system. Um, uh, what is that practice called where you're basically eliminating the, pho really discouraging photosynthesis to happen is one of the things that I encourage folks to do, whether that's building up. Um, tillage is, what are your thoughts, Javin? It's It really depends on the context. It depends mm -hmm. on the plant that you're trying to get rid of, and it depends on what you're trying to grow in that area. Yeah. So generally when I'm working with folks and we have undesirables, um, I, I've tried as much as possible to move away from the word weed only because it feels like plant racism. We just don't like it. It's just <laughs> in a place that we don't like. So uh, generally when we take a look at a plant, we have to place it into... Uh, an, an ecological succession. So where is this plant? Why is it here? So putting our mindset into the plant saying, okay, here's a plant. It might be what we consider a hardworking native, or it could be uh, an exotic, but on the time scale of the planet, plants move around a ton. So it just helps to kind of break the hold of this whole weed and invasive conversation that we have in our mindset, which is also quite funny for a bunch of humans who have colonized the entire planet to call anything else invasive. So when you're taking a look at some of the plants that are, are problematic, um, usually if we're taking a look at the broad scale uh, compared to the small scale, there's a couple of solutions. One of them is intensive grazing and one of them is removal. And then one of them is, is overplanting and overgrowth. On a smaller scale, we can work with things like silage tarps. So six, eight, 10 mil silage tarp, white on one, white on one side, black on the other. And we can tarp an area thereby cutting out, as Joe was talking about, the photosynthetic capacity. Um, we usually start by scalping the, the undesirables. So we, we basically cut them down with a brush cutter or with a weed whacker close to the stem. And if they're particularly pernicious, um, things like um, bindweed is a great, great example. Um, I'll usually use agricultural vinegar at a strength of 12% and a backpack sprayer and spray into the Mary stem that's been cut. Then I solarize. And then after that solarization, I'm coming in and I'm either outright planting or we're doing a disc, a till, and a rake to pull all the roots up. Because some of these plants have, you know, a root nodule that's only a quarter of an inch thick can regrow. So it really all depends on the scale, the scope, the size, and the budget. 
because sometimes the budget doesn't support any of this. And so there's not much that can be done. But generally working with the ecological succession and moving it towards the succession you want does most amount of the work and then ensuring that the biology within the soil is within that successional lineage. So if like Joe was showing, if you want to create an orchard and you're getting a lot of these, these annuals that are pioneers, your knapweed, your canary grass, things like that, being, um, being specific about, okay, well, I want to move this fungally dominated forward. Then the soil food web in the soil becomes less hospitable for a lot of those pioneering weeds. Um, so yeah, that's a real short answer. Um, that was very long. <laughs> <laughs> Something else I want to add, uh, you mentioned bindweed, uh, typically nauseous weeds, they, uh, tend to thrive in disturbed soils. Um, they tend to thrive in, uh, soils that have poor infiltration and poor aeration. So it's, it's good to really also focus on rebuilding your structure and getting your microbiome out into the soil to support the plants that you do want to grow. And then you will see how those weeds will try, will eventually it, in combination with what Javin had mentioned, all those different practices, but you'll also see how they'll tend to sort of move away from that section of the field that you're trying to to uh, recover. Yeah, great, great. Um, Gwen just popped up. Jav, your perspective on weeds invasive is refreshing. Haven't thought about it that way. You know, once we get out of this monoculture of the mind and have to be so obsessed with having a war against something so we justify a job for life, you can really start to see the planet as an ecosystem that ebbs and flows over the years and that there were palm trees where Joe lives at some point. You know, we've we really changed that conversation. The other book I highly recommend is Beyond the War on Invasives by Dow O'Ryan. Uh, she's a fellow instructor at Oregon State University and the book is exceptional. Highly, highly recommend it. Okay, we've got our first winner, our first winner in a spot in the course, uh, Vanessa Simmons. Vanessa Simmons, you won a spot in the course. Um, congratulations. We're really looking forward to seeing you on November 6th. Uh, please email me. I'll put it in the chat in a second, but please email me at javin at allpointsdesign.ca and we'll get you set up. Okay, next question. Aaron, how many applications of the extract for the results shown and how frequently? Uh, so Aaron, for the fall season, uh, we only sprayed three times every seven to 14 days. And uh, for the, it's the same for the South Orchard. So it's just three times within the season. You can do more if you like. Um, and we always had to time it based on weather. Awesome. From Lori, any tips on how to change up seasonal recipes when feedstock doesn't change as much as the outdoor temperature? We are in zone four. Mm. So Regarding uh, if feedstock doesn't change, uh, but the temperatures outside are changing, I would protect that compost as best as you can. Uh, so try to keep it away from the wind. Try to uh, make sure that it doesn't get well, snows okay, but as long as it doesn't get rained on, uh, you don't want saturation in your compost. So try to cover it or even move your compost somewhere where you know it's going to be protected um, in the wintertime. Great. From one, why don't you use molasses in the early stages of soil remediation? Doesn't it encourage the microorganisms reproduction? Yeah, so we do use molasses in the soil, but I don't use it in the brewer um, for growing microorganisms. The reason being is that if you use it as part of your compost tea process, you are selecting for a high uh, amount of bacterial communities that could uh, basically discourage your pump from providing enough oxygen to grow the microbes, beneficial microbes in your, in your solution. So you could be depriving your organisms in the water of oxygen because molasses is, it's a highly labile ingredient. It's easily metabolized by bacteria. They love those types of simple sugars. And if they grow too fast, too quickly, your pump is not going to be able to keep up with the oxygen demand and you could end up growing pathogenic organisms in your compost tea. So what I usually recommend is you use, uh, kelp, hydrolyzed kelp or hydrolyzed fish, um, something that's not as labile where it selects for bacteria and fungi. So both of those organisms can thrive on those foods. You brew your tea and at the end of that brewing cycle, you could add a little bit of molasses and then you spray. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Uh, you said that you turned the compost three times. Is that really necessary? Can I use the compost to plant it directly? 
I don't know what the second part is, but the first part's pretty straightforward. Is it necessary? Um, if you're doing a static compost, it may not be necessary. It, thermophilic compost piles, for me, the ones that the type of composting that I do, um, it takes three turns for the entire, for the whole, uh, all of the ingredients to go through that thermophilic process. So there's a certain way of turning the pile as well. You want to make sure that all of the organic matter goes through that thermophilic process so that the weed seeds and any organisms that cause disease can be handled or managed by the thermal stage. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Uh, we got our second winner here. Our second winner is Sunny Bereke. Sunny, you've won a spot in the course. Really looking forward to having you in the course on November 6th. Um, please email me at javin at allpointsdesign.ca. I'll also put your uh, my contact down in the chat. From Sandy, what's the best source of a large quantity of inputs for Johnson Sioux Bioreactor? Right now, we have a lot of apples, but they have been treated. The best source for a large quantity of inputs. Um, typically for resources, I highly encourage my clients to reach out to uh, other businesses that may have resources uh, that you could use. So whether that's wood chips, wood chips is extremely useful, valuable for growing your fungal biomass. Maybe you could use some straw, um, uh, a little bit of spent grain so you can connect with uh, microbreweries, um, any other growers out there that may have uh, ingredients that you can incorporate into your compost pile, just connect with them and, and see what they have. And uh, even coffee shops. Um, I think that's what that question was about um, as far as, yeah, resources go or inputs. Great. From Gwen, what happens to the microbes in the compost pile during winter? I get minus 40 temperatures in Alberta. Should the compost pile be covered? Yeah, so the compost pile should be covered. You may, the microbial activity will just probably slow down. Um, some of those organisms may go uh, into the dormant state. They'll start producing spores like bacteria. Fungi may slow down as well. And then when temperature starts to warm up, um, they receive enough moisture. Those organisms can wake up. Some of them will also wake up. It's it's very similar to how plants are in the system, right? Seeds, they go dormant when it's too cold, when they don't have enough water. And then when the conditions are right, they wake up. Great. Thanks, Joe. From Aaron, what about municipal water supplies with chlorine and making the extract? Is the microbial life robust enough to handle this amount? Or how long would it take to off-gas chlorine with aeration? You know, Aaron, I always use municipal municipal uh, water supply. Um, I've never had any issues. As long as you're using diverse ingredients in your compost pile, I think that they'll be fine. Um, I've had great results with using, you know, I've never had any issues. So you can definitely use uh, municipal water. Yeah. And I think, I think the one caveat there is that um, if you're working with a municipality that has chloramine as, a poor, as opposed to chlorine, um, that can be quite persistent. And usually that has to be offset with citric acid. And we talk about that during the course. Uh, Kiva, do you use all the compost in making teas and extracts or do you put some of it directly on the soil? No, uh, a lot of times we always have leftover compost and we use it as the mother culture for the next piles. And I mean, if you want to use the ret all of it, feel free, but we always have leftover. Um, again, this is really, we're trying to just build uh, a small, smaller piles and m optimize that material. So we always end up with leftovers a lot of times. Great. From Andra, Joe, do you have an experience with building good soil in Mediterranean climates? Not yet. <laughs> 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 uh, from Amanda, how do you know when you should turn the compost pile? Oh, so that's a whole um, whole subject that I'll be that's part of the course. Uh, there are temperatures that you need to manage uh, that you need to record. Moisture is also essential. I think if if you don't have a thermometer, smell smells a really good indicator of when to turn that compost pile, and also moisture level. Um, when you start to smell your compost, and especially in the middle and you, you're smelling ammonia, you're smelling raw egg odor, um, I think it's time to turn that compost. Nice. Thanks, Joe. Claire, is the recording available? Yes, it is. It'll be sent out in a day's time, or maybe two. Uh, Evan, I'm a bit, a uh, bit more big picture type question on a landscape with no biomass or very little, but acquiring a massive amount of compost resources be beneficial, even if tri 
traditional composting isn't feasible at the time, i.e., if I could spread a dump truck of food waste from a cafeteria in an area and cover with wood chips, would that work? Wouldn't that be similar to sheet mulching? Apologize or apologies for the convoluted question. I think the biggest concern there would be what animals will you be attracting into the area if you're just going to be spreading a bunch of food, right? Um, are you going to be attracting wild animals? Do you want, you know, just making sure that you're aware of that as well? Um, and if you know that, you know, the wood chips are thick enough because they are, you know, bears or coyotes, they're going to be able to smell that material. They're going to be able to dig it out. Um, so I think that's the biggest concern with that practice. However, if you want to continue with it, I would do it in the fall and let that material decompose over the fall and then don't plant into it until next spring. Great. Susanna, about the course, how many hours per week are expected to achieve the learning goals? Great question. So we've got two hours per session. Um, I would say for the majority of the resources I've seen Joe put up, and I'll check with Joe here, I would say probably somewhere between two and three hours a week, Joe, in terms of reading and watching. Yeah. It's, it's quite extensive. Um, yeah. Yeah. So depending on reading time and, and whatnot, I would say probably two and three. And then there is an exercise um, that uh, and an assignment that folks will be working through. And probably what, Joe? Probably a, a, an hour a week with maybe an hour and a half closer towards the end. Yeah. The last four sessions, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So two hours of actively being on the call or rewatching it. Um, two to three hours for resource uh, and content viewing and reading and all, all that. And then probably an hour a week for um, the exercise and the assignment. Great question. Karen, regarding cover crops, assuming they are not tilled in, how do I process the above ground growth? Oh yeah, we already had that. Um, love the idea of the course, hoping for zone four examples, not just zone seven and eight. Comment? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah, so Joe and I have both worked in colder climates. Um, I grew up in Alberta and uh, lived in Zone Four in BC for a while there. So we'll definitely have others as well. Yeah, of course, also have... be done off. Oh, good. I was just gonna say I'm working with a Saskatchewan farmer right now as well. Yeah. So can the course be done offline? Yes, absolutely. So I might have skipped that or just said it quickly. So um, for a lot of folks who can't meet the time of the live session, what they'll do is they'll come back after the, the fact. They'll work through the recorded material. They can still ask questions. We have a static question and answer document. So if you have a question, you can put it in there. Joel will answer it live. You can see the replay and then further the question. But yes, uh, it can be done uh uh, totally offline from the perspective of you don't have to be live on the call. Um, the course is, of course, online via the internet and the course player and all the rest of that. But yes, you you don't have to be there live for time differences, 100%. Harold, I love the soil microbiome. Me too, Harold. Have you done any research or familiar with incorporating this in more closed systems such as aquaponics? I am not familiar with it, uh, incorporating it in aquaponics, unfortunately. Are you, Chevin? No, no, I, uh, I have firm beliefs about aquaponics just from the perspective of uh, a good portion of it turns into bottle ponics where it's mostly supported by outside elements. It works in some situations really well, but the embodied energy of it compared to soil born situations are just, um, it, it's a hard, hard conversation to have. I think it makes a little bit more sense in cities. Um and there's, there's some value in that, but I've never incorporated um, mycology uh, from compost into it. I have worked in an aquaponic system where we seeded it, so to speak, from water from another uh, aquaponic system, but that's kind of the closest I can get. Esther, I'm having a lot of uh, actinobacteria in my hot compost piles. Can you say anything about that? Yeah, so reducing compaction. So if you're using materials like uh, hay or straw um, and you moisten that material or you apply moisture into that material, they tend to compact. So just making sure that it's well aerated, you mix your materials really, really well. Uh, so if you have a more uh, homogenous mixture, um, then it's, it's less likely that actinobacteria will thrive because they tend to thrive in low oxygen levels. So... Uh, have enough air pockets in your compost and incorporating more wood chips, for instance. Um, different size materials is really important so that you have different, uh, you know, pore spaces, sizes of pore spaces, I mean. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. 
From Belkis, such a pleasure to attend this presentation. Loads of thanks. Thanks so much, Belkis. We love seeing that. From Stuart, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, I want to take this course very much, but I'm concerned uh, about uh, the timing and how much I'm able to handle. Struggling with the amount of time I'm putting into the OSU PDC. Yeah, Deborah. So I think we talked a little bit about that. So two hours of live a week, um, three hours of resources, and then an hour, hour and a half of presentation. That should give you a good sense of the, the timing there. Thank you. That makes sense. Javin, can you repeat the reference for further reading? Uh, Susanna, I can. Can you remind me what we were talking about? Um, what resource was I talking about? Do you remember, Joe? I have no idea. We talked okay, about good. so much. <laughs> Amanda, thanks so much. This was interesting. Thanks, Amanda. I have a lot of thistle in small field, and one way to kill them is to chop at the base and add a little vinegar. There we go. Would this be detrimental to soil health? You know, as long as you, um, in addition to that, as long as you try to, you know, improve the soil microbiome um, on top of trying to get rid of the thistle. And really, if you're working towards recovery, if you're working towards restoring the microbiome, I think you're going in the right direction. Okay, nice. Somebody has just said uh, they thought it was Beyond the War. Yeah, so yeah, that's called Beyond the War of Invasives by Dow O'Ryan. So thanks. Um, very good. Uh, Christina, in my area, Oxalis comes up early in the winter spring since it draws on a bulb. How, what can I plant that would come up earlier and outcompete Oxalis or smother it? Oh, good question. Kind of outside the realm of this. Um, you know, generally, uh, what zone are you in and where are you in in the world? That'll help me answer that question if we can come back to it. Sonny, how can, how can we have this knowledge training of regenerating soil here in a refugee camp? Well, Sonny, um, like I said, you've won a spot in the course, uh, turned out pretty well there. Um, so you could end up being one of the individuals who learns and then helps to share that within the refugee course or, or refugee camp or reach out. Maybe we can um, figure out some training specifically for you folks. Feel free to send me an email. In my area, hugel beetle are popular, putting organic matter in a pile, covering it with mulch and planting directly in. That's why I'm asking about the turning question. In this case, you're going to have composting process underneath the plants. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if Hugo be beetle is, is, or BT is uh, similar to Hugo culture, but very similar conversation, uh, usually when we're composting or allowing big pieces of wood to decompose in a large pile uh, of soil. So there's definitely that ability. Um, could you use the break to catch up? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So if you wanted to use that break of three weeks to catch up with the material, absolutely. You could. MJ, what are your thoughts on adding aerobic effective microorganisms, EM, in addition to compost tea? And when bring the tea, is there a limit on the size of container or an ideal size? Um, my thoughts on adding anaerobic effective microorganisms, I don't go ahead. I think it's it's very beneficial. When brewing the tea, is there a limit on the size? No, it depends on the scale that you're trying to restore. Great. Um, beyond the war and invasives, the reference, and then yeah, the oxalis is in the Bay Area. Uh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. I would see the, the issue with bulbs is that bulbs are a strategy within a plant to store energy, vitality within the bulb to come up year after year after year after year. So camas, oxalis, obviously, um, tulips. Um, so basically what you have to do is you have to disturb the bulb because the bulb sometimes can go dormant and live for years. So while I don't know specifically about this, here's how I would go about trying to solve it. Research on oxalis, research how long a bulb can be dormant until it uh, comes back up. Um, see if there's a break, a weak link within the vegetative and reproduction cycle of that plant that you can disrupt. So do seeds become new plants that become new bulbs? Is it a bulb off bulb situation, kind of like a garlic? Um, and then you'll have to work at it uh, from a perspective of how do we disrupt or remove those bulbs and then make sure that that below soil area is, because it's not just with bulbs, it's not about out competing it from above ground, it's about out competing it from below ground. So really being focused on what is the root structure below ground and is there enough area for that? I'd also try to see where it is on the spectrum. Um, so if it's further along succession 
or if it's closer to disturbance, and then maybe start to plant and move things towards perennial and then uh, application of, of fungal dominated compost extracts and teas. That would be my approach. Joe, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with everything you said. I think this is beyond my knowledge. Okay, cool, cool. Um, oh, the last person I chose, they, uh, they're not here anymore. So I'm just going <laughs> to go back into the random selectalizer and um, see if, uh, who's the next person? Okay, there we go. Um, great. So congratulations to Meg's Riordan. Meg's Riordan, you are the last person to win a spot in the course. Great to, great to have you here on the call and great to have you in the course. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, we came together for an hour and a half on a Thursday to talk about soil. And that's rad. <laughs> there's, there's, uh, 66 people in the world that are keen enough to spend the time to talk about this. And I just have to say, thank you. Uh, we need an incredible array of people who are working locally with their context, with what they can, with where they are to move us along within the humans will be here into the future conversation. And uh, Joe's work is just one of those incredible pieces of conversation. So I'm really excited that you all showed up. I'm really excited that we had this conversation today. And I just want to thank you all for being here. Uh, as I said before, if you would like to join um, the course, we have a great opportunity between now and Sunday. If you want to join the course for just $249, um, most of the courses are all going to be raised in price next year. So if you are interested, this is a great opportunity to jump in. You can use the coupon code CLS2024 web and register for the course. I'll make sure to put that back into the chat just before we leave here. Got some great thanks coming. Thank you, Javin and Joe, for your time and knowledge from Esther. Thank you very much. Joe, final words, final send off, bumper stickers, things you want to tell folks in terms of next steps, what to do, where to go. What are you thinking? Peace and love to everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Thanks so much for the work in the world you do, my friend. And thank you for being willing to share it both in the course and during the webinar. So nice to be able to give a little bit back to the community. Um, for everybody else, thank you again for joining. The replay will be out uh, within a day or two. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in class uh, sometime soon. Take care and all the best.